is time for an honest look at the problem of order in the United States. Dissent is a necessary ingredient of change. But in a system of government that provides for peaceful change, there is no cause that justifies resort to violence. Let us recognize that the first civil right of every American is to be free from domestic violence. So I pledge to you, we shall have order in the United States. The, the subtitle suggests it's a book about, it's a political analysis of Richard Nixon's challenge to the liberalism of the Warren Court and the electoral and legal consequences. And there are many moments or snapshots in this book. Um, I'm just going to talk about three, three of those moments. And it's still going to take me about 30 or 40 minutes to get to get to those three moments. So the moments are from different parts of the book, um, and they're not chronological. So the first moment is August 8th, 1968, which centers on the presidential campaign. Moment two is October 21st, 1971, when Nixon nominates Lewis Powell and William Rehnquist in the Supreme Court. Those are his, his last two appointments to the court. And moment three is April 20th, 1971, which was the day the Supreme Court announced its decision in Swan case. And it was the first time the court approved a lower court order requiring widespread busing to ensure desegregation of a dual school system. This was a case out of North Carolina. For me, it's important because it helps explain the Justice Department's litigation strategy on school desegregation. But let me first talk about the beginning of the book. And I begin with a story of a man named Eddie Wenzel. Uh, some of you may recognize that name if you've read The Last Fine Time by Vernon Wall. Uh, Klinkenberg. Um, Eddie Wenzick is a bar owner. He uh, runs a bar and grill on the east side of Buffalo, New York. And he's important to me because he represents the type of voter that Richard Nixon was trying to attract in 1968. <laughs> Along with the white southerners, <clears throat> um, disgruntled with the Democratic Party, Nixon sought to appeal to white ethnic, mostly Catholics, who were living in the electoral rich northern states and cities like New York and Boston and Cleveland and Buffalo. While these voters had overwhelmingly supported Kennedy in 1960 against Nixon, eight years later, candidate Nixon spied an opportunity. While traditionally Democrats, many of these ethnic Catholics of the urban north were culturally conservative. And in 1968, they were uncertain about the liberalism of the Democratic Party. And now to moment one, uh, eight, August 8, 1968, the final night of the Republican Convention in Miami. In Richard Nixon's mind, in the summer of 1968, America was no longer the place it used to be. And in an effort to make it to the White House on a second try, he vowed to speak for the forgotten Americans, those he would later refer to as members of the great silent majority. As Nixon put it to the Republican delegates that night, these Americans were the non-shouters, the non-demonstrators. They were good and decent people who worked hard, saved, and paid their taxes. But in recent years, they had been ignored, left out of the national discussion, and left to watch as crime soared, as the nation's cities burned, its youth eagerly denounced authority, and its war in Vietnam marched into another year without a plan for peace. Nixon's words that night spoke to a variety of concerns, but they centered on the issue that would come to define the campaign, indeed a generation of campaigns. The issue attracted a variety of labels, from crime in the streets to law and order, but it was probably best described as the social issue, a phrase that captured the broader amalgamation of anxieties that exploded onto the scene in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Indeed, in the minds of many Americans, as one commentator has written, 
ghetto riots, campus riots, street crime, anti-Vietnam marches, poor people's marches, drugs, pornography, welfareism, rising taxes, all had a common thread. The breakdown of the family and social discipline, of order, of concepts of duty, of respect for law, of public and private morality. And strikingly, the institution allegedly responsible for causing the erosion of the moral fabric of American society was the Supreme Court of the United States. To its critics and its drive to oust inequality and racial discrimination from the core of the American experience, the Warren Court had, more, had done more wrong than right. To them, its recent decisions had aided communist forces, abetted criminals in, intent on causing harm, threatened to dislodge school children from the security of their neighborhoods, unleashed a wave of pornographic smut, released murderers from death row, forced prayer out of the schools, and loosened society's constraints on promiscuity. It did it all, moreover, in the name of the Constitution, a document nearly two, century, two centuries old, but interpreted by the court's nine unelected wise men to keep up with the times, to live even though its drafters had died long ago. With decisions so easily typecast as unflinchingly liberal, it didn't take much to convince voters unnerved by the rebellious spirit of the 60s that the Supreme Court was at least partially responsible for the unrest throughout the land. And if anyone needed a push in that to make the connection, two of the main contenders for the presidency stood ready to explain. As Richard Nixon constantly reminded his audiences, the, the decisions of the court, decisions like the Miranda case, had the effect of seriously hamstringing, this is Nixon's words, had, this, had the effect of seriously hamstringing the peace forces in our society and strengthening the criminal forces. Third party candidate George Wallace was more blunt, referring to the court as a sorry, lousy, no account outfit, and blaming it for just about everything plaguing the land. Indeed, in the hands of Nixon and Wallace, the Supreme Court became a powerful tool for attracting votes, a device for constructing a new electoral coalition. So it brings us to this commercial, right? So this is a one commercial, and probably one of the more powerful commercials from Nixon's campaign. And if you notice the, the phrasing that he uses, a, a phrase that he uses throughout the campaign, the first civil right of every American, which he means to be the right to be free from domestic violence, right? This is very crafty use of the word civil rights, or the phrase civil rights. He's turning civil rights on its head. So no longer is civil rights about protecting the rights of African Americans or, or other minorities. Instead, it, it's about combating crime in the streets. Hearing, hearing these words, liberals grew alarmed. With Nixon's election, they feared his appointments would challenge and perhaps reverse some of the Warren Court's great decisions expanding rights. However, most analyses of this Nixon-constructed Burger Court suggest that the president did not succeed. In view of both liberal and conservative scholars and commentators, it was a counter-revolution that wasn't. The Burger Court not only left many of the Warren Court decisions untouched, it expanded rights in other areas. In fact, the most significant decision coming out of this time period is the 1973 decision, Roe versus Wade, which is hardly a conservative decision. Writing in 1987, Herman Schwartz noted, one would never have expected this in, in 1969 when Richard Nixon nominated Warren Berger to be Chief Justice. My argument is that President Nixon didn't fail but that he succeeded. However, his approach to the court has been misunderstood and misjudged. I argue that two principles 
dominated Richard Nixon's thinking about judicial policy and strategy. First, electoral success was more important than advancing an ideologically consistent brand of judicial conservatism. More specifically, his policy toward the judiciary was geared less to constructing a thoroughly conservative Supreme Court and more toward tempering judicial liberalism with the hopes of dismantling the New Deal coalition and creating a Republican majority. Second, Nixon's definition of conservatism with regard to the Supreme Court was quite limited. Indeed, he's really interested in two issues. One, law and order, as we see in this commercial, and two, the desegregation of the schools. He wasn't interested in unleashing a conservative counter-revolution against the Warren Court. So this leads to the moment two. October 21st, 1971, when Nixon nominates Lewis Powell of Virginia and William Rehnquist of Arizona to the court. Nixon, um, Nixon, Nixon's appointment, first some background, Nixon's appointments to the court, which garner a great deal of contention, sorry, attention, are really a mixture of different types of nominees. Significantly in naming four new justices to the nation's highest tribunal in the space of two and a half years, Nixon had an unusual opportunity to affect constitutional doctrine. No president had placed four men on the court so soon into his first term since Warren Harding done so in the early 1920s. Nixon was lucky for another reason. Three of the four justices who left the bench Hugo Black, Earl Warren, and Abe Fortas were liberals of the first order. Nixon ultimately nominates six jurors to the court, but the Senate only confirms four of them. First, in 1960, May of 1969, you know, five months into his presidency, he nominates Warren Berger to replace Chief Justice Earl Warren. Berger was seen as a non-controversial appointment. Newspaper reports concluded that he was tough on law and order, and he was moderate on civil rights. That, that record allowed him to win quick and easy confirmation. In selecting a, just, a justice who had an image of being tough on law and order was really an easy choice for President Nixon. Just consider two polls. One poll, January 1969, the month Nixon becomes president, asks the following question. In general, do you think the courts in this area deal too harshly or not harshly enough with criminals? Less than 2% of respondents answered too harshly. Another poll placed significant blame for the difficulty in combating crime directly on the doorsteps of the Supreme Court. Specifically, it showed that 82% of American men, 50% a great deal, and 32% somewhat, agreed that, quote, recent Supreme Court decisions have made it more difficult to punish criminals. Filling the vacancy created by the resignation of Aid Fortis, which also occurred in May of 1969, proved to be far more difficult for Nixon. Nixon, in part to advance his Southern strategy, and one thing I, I didn't point out is Warren Berger was in Minnesota. So to advance his Southern strategy, Nixon wanted to name a Southerner. And he appoints the first person is uh, Judge Hainsworth, the Supreme Court rejects him. Hainsworth's from South Carolina. What's striking about the Hainsworth appointment is Nixon is elected in 68, runs a campaign that focuses on Supreme Court issues, wins the election. 40% of Republican senators, Republican senators, vote against the Hainsworth nomination. Something unthinkable in today's divided party politics. 
Hainsworth is rejected based on questions of his ethics. Uh, if he's, you know, if he's uh, fit ethically fit for the court, uh, but analyses show that it's really a it's really an ideological vote in the Senate. Many of those Republicans were Republicans from what are now blue states. Um, after Hainsworth is defeated, he appoints Carswell, Judge Carswell from Florida. Carswell is also rejected. This time, 32% of Republican senators vote against his confirmation. Again, almost unthinkable, thinkable in today's environment. Nearly a year after Fortas's resignation, the Senate finally confirms Nixon's third choice. His name is Harry Blackman, who was also from Minnesota, happened to be Warren Berger's best man at his wedding. They went to kindergarten together. And he was, he was a similar type of nominee, tough on law and order, moderate on civil rights. And in that time period, that was what you needed to get for a Republican uh, appointee to get confirmed by the Senate. And he, again, just like Berger, fairly easy, quick and easy confirmation. Fast forward to fall 1971. Nixon has the opportunity to fill two more vacancies. Justice Harlan, Justices Harlan and Black resigned from the court um, because of ill health. And here he's determined to appoint a Southerner. From the, for the other, the other vacancy, there's a variety of choices. One might be another Southerner, so you appoint two Southerners. Um, another, he wanted to appoint a woman. And the third, he thought seriously about appointing a Catholic. There was one Catholic on the court, Justice Brennan, but Je Brennan, even though he had been appointed by Eisenhower, was not the uh, definition of a conservative, as many of you know. Um, so he wanted really someone who would pack political punch. Uh, that's what he was really looking for. And what makes, it, what, what makes these selections really interesting is by this point, Nixon has set up his recording system. So you can get, up, you can get a, a good understanding of what the thinking was because you can listen to the conversations of what was going on in the White House. So consider his desire to appoint a woman. It certainly wasn't because he thought highly of women. <laughs> At least not from what he said on the tapes. At various points on those tapes, the president makes disparaging comments about women. For example, at one point he said, I'm not for, this is him speaking, and I don't have a Nixon voice, so I apologize for that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not for women, frankly, in any job. I don't want any of them around. Thank God we don't have any in the cabinet. Now, whether these thoughts were represented the stuff of locker room chat, chatter to the boys in the room or his true feelings, they did not deter him from appreciating the political significance of naming it the first female justice. Indeed, the president himself was the most persistent advocate in the Oval Office for appointing, appointing a woman. As he said it, quote, hell, I'm against it myself, but it's got to be done. <laughs> He continued, again, this is Nixon. Basically, politically, it isn't going to lose us a vote. A lot of people will grumble and say, why the press the woman? And a hell of a lot of women, and to a hell of a lot of women, it would make believers out of them. That's just what it gets down to. See my point? You poll the country, 60% of the people at least would say okay to a woman judge. As far as those who do not vote, sorry, who do not vote against Nixon because he appointed a woman, a woman, it's zero. But on the other hand, how many vote for Nixon because he appointed a woman? 1%, maybe 10%, that's the point. It's a hell of a thing. Even though Chief Justice Berger threatened to resign if Nixon appointed a woman, the president didn't care. 
and DD vowed to accept the resignation. Regarding the appointment of a Catholic, Nixon aide Patrick Buchanan, a name that many of you know well, was the most forceful advocate inside the White House. For example, on September 20th, 1971, three days after Justice Hugo Black's announced retirement from the court, Buchanan wrote the following to the President. Not Blacks, not Jews, but ethnic Catholics, Poles, Irish, Italians, Slovaks, those are where the ducks are, right? Those are where the votes are. Um, we ought to now be can canvassing, canvassing the best legal and judicial conservative minds in the Italian-American, the Irish-American, and the Polish-American community. And Nixon was clearly receptive to Buchanan's ideas. Responding to one of his memos in the recorded conversation, he's right. <laughs> and then endorsing an ethnic stereotype, he adds, you know, it's too bad we don't have an Italian an honest Italian judge that I know of. Wish we did. <laughs> when I gave this lecture, by the way, um, Justice Scalia was the justice who introduced me. Uh, so it was a little hard given that, saying that line with him sitting, <laughs> sitting right about there, so I made sure I looked the other way. <laughs> um, so, he, he continues, wish we did, wish we had a poll. There ain't anything in it for us to appoint a Protestant, not a goddamn thing. It means nothing to the Protestants. It could mean a hell of a lot to the Catholics. So what's motivating Nixon here? And in terms of electoral strategy, Nixon had to consider the possibility of another Wallace candidacy. So remember, in 1968, Wallace wins five southern states. And he draws other votes uh, in other states. Doesn't win them, but draws votes. Certainly Nixon thought he, he was drawing votes from him, uh, even though many of these voters were Democrats. So he has to consider the possibility of another Wallace candidacy. If Wallace didn't run, naming a southerner or two would help him in the once thoroughly Democratic South. But if Wallace did run, the choice of a woman or an ethnic Catholic would help him in a battleground state strategy that was very similar to 1968. As you know, ultimately, Wallace, because of uh, an assassination attempt, does not run. Um, and and therefore it becomes just a, a two-person race. Um, in reviewing Nixon's thoughts on these appointments, it's important to note that the pool of potential nominees was limited, since Nixon wanted someone who was qualified, three, three factors. He wants them qualified, reliably conservative, and politically beneficial. And more often than not, he had to compromise on one of these three qualities. Nevertheless, soon after the vacancies occurs, Nixon settles on naming a Southerner, an Arkansas attorney by the name of Herschel Friday, and a woman, uh, Judge Mil Mil Mildred Lilly of California. Lilly also happened to be Catholic, and she was married to an Italian-American. <laughs> So this, when he heard this news, this bit of news, the president responded with joy. He was very delighted. As a trial balloon, the administration released the name of six possible nominees. But the president had really decided on Friday and on Lou. Then there was a problem. When the names were released, there was widespread criticism. For example, one liberal group called them a bewildering assortment of mediocrities. Ted Kennedy said the, rep, the list represented one of the great insults to the Supreme Court in its history. Among the justices, there was concern as well. According to one news report, Justice Harlan, whose retirement had created the second vacancy, and who was often described as the court's conservative conscience, was so outraged that he seriously considered writing the president a letter of protest. One liberal justice, after reading some of Judge Lilly's opinions, went home 
and got drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Within the administration, there was concern as well. During the vetting process, Washington lawyers raised questions about the qualifications of the two nominees and also their commitment to conservatism. However, the president was very attracted by their political symbolism, believed them to be sufficiently conservative, and intended, intended to appoint them. But then, the American Bar, Bar Association Standing Committee, which was much more part of the process then than it is today, rated them both as unqualified for the court. Friday by a vote of six to six, and Lily by a vote of 11 to one. <laughs> in the past, Nixon probably would have sent the names to the Senate anyway, to make a point. But things were different now. It was time to search again. Still, he was angered that his opponents had denied him the political payoff that he had hoped for. And he viewed the vote on Lilly as overkill, an extra turn of the screw. In starting the process over, the president focused much more on the quality of the potential nominees, not on their political significance. And quite quickly, he settled on a resistant but very well-respected Lewis Powell of Virginia, who would be Nixon Southerner, and William Rehnquist of Arizona, who didn't offer much in the way of political symbolism, but was highly regarded for his intellect. Before he decided on Rehnquist, however, the president pursued another Southerner, Senator Howard Baker of Tennessee, a young Southerner who ultimately ran for the court for the presidency himself. And in a wonderful revealing conversation with Attorney General John Mitchell, the president agonized over whether to appoint a once reluctant Baker or Rehnquist. For 53 seconds, Richard, Richard Nixon did not say a word during the phone call, clearly mulling over what a Baker appointment would offer. The need to decide brought unease, almost pain, as he sighed several times. Ultimately, he was convinced by his own argument. As he said to his attorney general, Rehnquist has a hell of a record. Phi Beta Kappa, first in his class, law clerk, law clerk to one of the great judges of the century, Robert Jackson, and practiced law as a lawyer's lawyer. And with that statement, the decision was made. Howard Baker would stay in the U.S. Senate, and William Rehnquist would become the final, the fourth and final Nixon justice. In private conversation, however, the president still yearned for some political payoff with Rehnquist. At one point, he was upset to learn that Rehnquist was a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Joking that he should change his, he should switch religions. <laughs> At another point, the president joked again, suggesting that Rehnquist did a sex change operation. <laughs> <laughs> Nixon A. John Ehrlichman responded with, with practically, takes too long. <laughs> In the end, Nixon's liberal opponents had denied him the big political payoff that would have come with naming a woman or an ethnic Catholic to the court. But in doing so, they helped cut a path for William Rehnquist to become a justice. A justice who would prove to be one of liberalism's toughest and most enduring critics during his 33 and a half years on the bench. So the appointments typically get most of the attention, uh, particularly with Nixon, the, the ones that rejected were rejected, uh, Hainsworth and Carswell. Um, and in many ways, that helps explain the story that's told, uh, the conventional wisdom about Nixon's court, uh, that, it, that it should have been more doctrinal, doctrinally conservative than it was. However, specific actions in the administration, particularly within the Justice Department, um, are perhaps more revealing than appointments themselves. And this leads us to, to the third moment, April 20th, 1971, which again, was the day the Supreme Court announced its decision in the Swan case. First, some background. <coughs> President Nixon's first Solicitor General was Erwin Griswold. 
Uh, and I suggest that this appointment was highly significant. Griswold had served in the same post during Lyndon Johnson's administration. And he had a long track record, former dean of Harvard Law School, very well respected in, the, in legal service. In keeping his predecessor's solicitor general, the person who argues the administration's case before the court and is very instrumental in, in shaping uh, the court's agenda. He, it was truly an unprecedented event since the creation of that office. No president previously had retained the solicitor general of a president from the other party. Right? So any new president would come, who, of a different party would come in and choose a new solicitor general. So Nixon, in, in sticking with Griswold, that's very significant. It signals that Nixon's litigation strategy would be more about taming Warren Court liberalism than igniting a conservative counter-revolution. To be sure, in the second term, with the appointment of Robert Bork as Solicitor General, Nixon suggested he would pursue a more aggressive and more conservative approach. But as you know, the, the second term is really consumed by the Watergate scandal. Consider six major cases of the early 1970s, late 1960s, early 1970s. Roe versus Wade on abortion, Cohen versus California, which deals with free speech and profanity, Dandridge versus Williams, which deals with welfare rights, San Antonio versus Rodriguez, which deals with school finance and the right to education, Furman versus Georgia, which deals with the death penalty, and Miller versus California, which deals with pornography, which at the time was a very uh, a, a issue that the court dealt was dealing a lot with. Those six cases, all cases that are taught still today in a, in a standard constitutional law course. In each of those cases, the Nixon administration chose not to file a brief. It didn't want to say what its position was on these matters. But in the areas that I outlined earlier, school desegregation and law and order, uh, the Solicitor General's office was quite active. And in the Swan case, this, we're dealing with school desegregation. So this leads us back to April 1971. First, it's important to know that pr the president relied heavily on the distinction between de jure segregation, meaning segregation in law, the situation that existed throughout the South, and so-called de facto segregation which existed in much of the North and the West. With regard to de jure segregation in the South, the president accepted desegregation of the schools as a fait accompli. Rather than turning back the clock, as his critics charged him with doing, and at least one White House aide suggested, Pat Buchanan, the president sought an alternative route devising a plan of deferring to the courts that sought to lessen the presumed electoral burden of imp implementing the law. In other words, he did not want the ownership, he did not want ownership of civil rights enforcement. The onus should, should lie elsewhere. Still, in the end, as one historian concludes, this approach made Nixon the greatest school desegregation, des desegregator in American history. And the president was quite proud of the fact that it had occurred quite peacefully. At the same time, Nixon would seek to take electoral advantage of the after effects of its enforcement, hoping to build an enduring electoral coalition devoted to advancing prin principles more in line with his own. Consider his reaction to Swan, again, the first case where you had a busing. The reporting of the case suggested that the court had rejected the administration's position. For example, the New York Times reported in a banner headline, Supreme Court 9-0 backs busing to combat South's dual schools, rejecting administration's stand. 
the editorial writers at newspapers across the nation agreed, concluding that the decision was a major defeat for the, minister, the administration. However, the perception of the decision within the White House was starkly different. As Solicitor General Griswold later wrote, the position he argued before the justices was the view which was taken by the court. At the White House, Attorney General Mitchell reported to the, to the President, the important thing is that we are not faced with this de facto question, not faced with racial balance. Racial balance meaning that if a, a community is, say, 60% white and 40% black, the schools would need to be uh, of a similar balance. The court wasn't advocating that position in Swan. In turn, Nixon did not openly reject the decision as one might have expected by reading the headlines from the Times. In private, he acknowledged that it could have been worse because the court could have taken an aggressive stand on de facto segregation, but it did not. And in devising a response to the decision, the president wanted to send the message that his personal opinion didn't matter. Rather, now that the justices had ruled, it was his duty as president to carry out the mandate of the court, his words. In the North, the president pursued a more obstructionist line, once again emphasizing the distinction between de jure and de facto in response to the lower court interpretations of Swan. But the administration's litigation strategy hardly matched the president's rhetoric. Put simply, while he hoped to convince the court that it did not need to order quote, unquote, sorry, quote, instant integration, President Nixon was not willing to stand in front of a schoolhouse door. He was not willing to be George Wallace. So what does this all mean for evaluating Nixon's judicial strategy? I reach two main conclusions, and then offer a more global conclusion with regard to presidents in general. Conclusion one deals with President Nixon and the development of constitutional doctrine. And here I'm looking mainly at politically salient decisions. Given his specific focus on law and order and school desegregation, was Nixon really a failure with regard to the effect on the court? The evidence suggests he wasn't. Consider, for example, the 1974 busing decision in Milliken versus Bradley, uh, a, a decision out of Detroit, and the 1976 decision in Greg v. Georgia. In those two politically charged cases, the court, with all four Nixon appointed justices in the majority, essentially delivered results consistent with the views of the Nixon and Ford administrations. My second conclusion deals with President Nixon and electoral politics. Here, Nixon's judicial strategy was a success as well. His 49 state landslide in 1972 represented the largest popular and electoral vote victory of any presidential candidate since the party was formed in the mid 1850s. In capturing nearly 61% of the vote, President Nixon not only attracted Southern supporters of George Wallace, but nor urban Northerners who would later earn the misleading tag Reagan Democrats. I suggest that the term is misleading because they were Nixon Democrats before they were Reagan Democrats. Nixon achieved his electoral success in part by pursuing a judicial-centered social issue campaign that spoke to concerns of members of his great silent majority and helped construct a Republican majority at the presidential level, a majority that would endure for a generation and provide support for a conservative movement intent on transforming constitutional law. Consider the following elections. 1976, despite Watergate, despite Ford's pardon of Nixon, Jimmy Carter wins just 50.1% of the popular vote. It's a, one of the tightest elections uh, in recent memory. Obviously, 2000's uh, another one. 1980. Reagan wins 44% of the vote, nearly 51%, sorry, 44 states, nearly 51% of the vote in a three-man contest, 84, another 49-state landslide, 59% of the vote, 88, 
Bush has a comfortable victory with 55% of the vote and, and 40 states. More globally, the more global conclusion is simply this. At particular historical moments, presidents may be powerful agents of constitutional change. Thank you.